We welcome uh, Michael Spence of New York University and, of course, of Milan, Italy. Professor Spence, great to have you here. Thank you for being on. It's great to be with you, Tom. Michael, you look at the, um, your work on signals and you look at what we see in Europe, the fragility that is signaled by a 16% two-year yield in Greece. What does that signal to Michael Spence? Well, I, I think what that's reflecting, Tom, is the fact that the Europeans really haven't managed yet to decide um, the burden sharing, who's going to bear the costs of restoring fiscal balance and competitiveness in the economies that need it. And so the markets are uncertain uh, and reluctant to buy the bonds. So you have terrifically high risk premium. Let's look at the dreaded first chart, folks. And you can see it here, the DFC. We're bringing up here, Professor Spence, uh, the idea of Berlin considering Athens. And it's a chart that goes back 11 or 12 years. The German Greece spread, and you can just see the explosion of risk. Our interest rate sp spreads, Professor Spence, and credit default swaps, are these healthy or correct or efficient signals for politicians? Are they a tool that they can use? Well, they're not always healthy and efficient signals, and I think the best evidence for that was what happened in the crisis. I um, mean, the risk was building up, but in that case, it was unseen. In this case, I think they're probably reasonably accurate reflections that will tell the politicians that. Uh, that something needs to be done, and it has to be fairly dramatic. It, it can't just be uh, providing temporary liquidity so that these countries can roll over the bonds. If, if they had less of a problem, Greece in particular, you know, you might just buy them the time to get the job done, but most people, including me, think that if Greece has to do it on its own without any external help, no restructuring, and no currency to devalue, um, the, the fiscal rebalancing will kill so much growth that you never can get out I like the other how you, end of the pipe. Well, Professor, I like how you use the word dramatic. And I think of Alberto Alessina's request for courage from our politicians. When you, when you want drama from European leaders over this crisis, what kind of courage do you want to see? Well, I mean, in the end, I think what, what they're, the, the, the decision they're, they're in the process of making, and Europe always makes them a little slowly because they have a lot of parties to negotiate whatever they do, but, but basically they have to decide, you know, what each party is willing to pay to keep the Eurozone right. uh, in place and stable. I mean, this is a really critical point, folks. Here's an important chart, and it really goes to the wonderful synthesis Michael Spence has had between economics and the business community. Here's the Fed's balance sheet. And as you know, Professor Spence, it exploded from sub $1 trillion out nudging $2.3 trillion. And what we've done in three years is move from private debt. We folded it into a public debt consolidation. And the question, Michael Spence, is what do we go to? Do you just presume that what we're going to need to see are the so-called haircuts, that the commercial banks are just going to have to take a haircut on all those bond holdings? No, I don't think so. I mean, there is a path by which we can restore fiscal balance. It's a painful path. Uh, but I don't think we're yet in the position where we have to deliver that haircut either by pro probably the most likely delivery mechanism would be inflation. Uh, and so I don't, th I don't think that's inevitable, but there is some risk of that if the politics gets locked up on, um, the, on the fiscal pathway forward. I bring up the research note, Rex, if you would, on uh, the efficiency. There it is. This is from Michael Spence's laureate lecture. Folks, one of the great things in the world is a Nobel Prize website. And it's got beautiful, beautiful, lengthy, uh, some simple and some quite complex articles by the laureates. And here's Michael Spence on signaling. Bring that up again, folks, so I, I can see it. If, if, if you had signaling in retrospect, it is possible that the information carried by the signal increases efficiency. Michael Spence, what kind of efficiency do we need to see from Berlin, from London? Is it austerity? Is it, is it something through Brussels? Where do we see that efficiency if the markets are signaling these very, very wide spreads? I, I think what the... What, so th there's a bet that's being placed. 
Um, in London, the bet is that the future will be brighter if they um, accept the pain of uh, fiscal consolidation now. Um, the United States hasn't quite made that decision. Germany's a different case. Germany went through a major restructuring of the economy in the past 10 years, and it is behaving very differently from mm. almost all other advanced countries. Its exports are healthy. Uh, its export sector is diverse. Right. Its um, current account balance is positive. So in some ways, the Germans did something the rest of us didn't right. do, which is to get ready for this before it actually happened. We're going to come back with Michael Spence, uh, folks of New York University. Read this. This is important. It's his new book out in May, Michael Spence, The Next Convergence, The Future of Economic Growth in a Multi-Speed World. Look at that from Farrar Strauss in May. Michael Spence, we're going to come back with uh, Michael Spence. Professor Spence, I want to bring up, this is the vignette, folks. You think of Michael Spence as math and signals and efficiency. Look at this sentence. I love this. It's the note of the day. It's from the, the Spence Nobel Lecture. The overriding goal is not to look too stupid to the next generation of students and scholars. The laureate Michael Spence there uh, in her lighter uh, moment here. Do you guys, you know, Olivier Blanchard was on yesterday, Professor Spence, and they're doing a lot of thinking at the IMF with Joe Stiglitz and others about the future of macroeconomics. How stupid does the old guard look to the younger crew of economists after this financial crisis? Yeah, no, I was at that conference and um, co-hosted it with Joe and David Romer and, and Olivier. Um, I, I don't think the, the, the macro economists and policymakers look stupid. I, I think we're all on a learning curve. And, and I think we're in the position where we know we can't keep doing what we were doing before in a whole variety of areas, financial regulation, monetary right. policy, focused on one target with one instrument and all that yeah. that you probably talked about yesterday. But, but we don't actually know how to do the alternative, which is multiple instruments and multiple targets. Again, and Mike. so there's a huge opportunity. Uh, no, go ahead, There's a please. huge opportunity for the young people, I think. Yeah, the, the I think there's a huge opportunity for the young people to fill in the gap. And to, to deal with the new complexity that Olivier Blanchard talked about yesterday. Here's an elegant chart. Michael Spence, this is something you've really thought about. Our productivity does so well, and you can see how it has linked folks to compensation from about 1989 to 2002, and then our paychecks, our compensation, simply lags the American productivity miracle. What happened in the middle of the last decade, Professor Spence, to make our compensation lag? Um, it was a number of factors. The compensation is lagging mainly for sort of the middle income group and, and on down. And I, and I believe that is a function of the fact that we are losing our position in the lower value added parts of the tradable sector. And what that does is push labor into the non-tradable part of the economy, to government, health care, retail, a whole bunch of things, where the productivity levels are lower and the incomes are lower. So the net effect is you, you're starting to see a divergence between productivity in the, in the most productive parts mm -hmm. of the economy and incomes, and you're also seeing a, 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 a divergence between growth and employment on, uh, as well. Our last chart, Professor Spencer, will let you go, folks. This is from Barry Ritholtz, who will be on later. I love this from Visualizing Economics and MeasuringWorth.com. Uh, Professor Spence, 218 years of American growth, back to 1791, and it's a wonderful, relatively smooth curve. Do you have any doubt about the persistence of the American economic experience? No, I really don't, actually, um, Tom. I, I think that what we're going to see is a, a recovery to something like our normal rates of growth driven by productivity growth um, in the next few years. It'll be slower than we had hoped after the crisis, but I don't see any reason, uh, fundamental, long-term structural reason why we can't do that. The, the problem, as I said before, is not, is not going to probably turn out to be the growth. The, pro, the, the problem is going to turn out to be employment opportunities for the, uh, the people in the middle class and, and the lower part mm -hmm. of the income distribution.